And would you join me in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the boat, Jesus was still teaching, and this had been going on all day, with the crowd pressed in all around and surging and sloshing and jostling each other. That's why Jesus had gotten into the boat in the first place, so that he could be heard. Ironically, in order to be with them, Jesus needed a little bit of distance. He needed to be out in this boat in order to be heard and seen by this crowd. It would have been an odd sight to a passerby. This great crowd of people standing on a beach, all looking out at a man bobbing on the waves in a boat by himself just off the shore. Who is this? And people could and did ask that of the disciples. And the pressing in and the questions and the jostling that the crowd had for Jesus, those were just transferred over to the disciples because the crowd knew that they were with Jesus. And they had questions because it was almost as if Jesus was being intentionally obscure with his teachings. It is almost as if, by refusing to preach in any way but with parables, he was trying to be obscure. The crowd's questions swamped the disciples. What does he mean that the realm of God is like a mustard seed? It seems also like the word of God is maybe a wheat seed. And I get that I'm the lamp, but am I also the bushel basket? At this point, I'm lost. Is he like this? all the time? To which the disciples must reply, yes, he is like this, all the time. The crowd expects the disciples to have answers, and they don't. Answers hardly seem to be the point. Being with Jesus every day, as the disciples are, it means being constantly buffeted by these questions, the main one being, who is this? He is compelling and confounding, enchanting and infuriating. Who is this? At the end of the long day, when Jesus has nothing left to say to the crowd, he says to the disciples, get into the boat with me. We're going across the lake to the other side. This is not a quick row across the pond, mind you. Depending on the route, this crossing across the Sea of Galilee, it might be 10 miles or more. And once they are on their way, far out enough from the shore, a great storm picks up. A gale begins buffeting them about. Now, luckily for them, there are among the disciples not a few excellent sailors. These are people who had made their living sailing on the Sea of Galilee. And they knew, they knew when to drop the sails because the wind was too high. They knew this, and they did so, and the storm was still too much. They knew full well that you are supposed to point the boat straight into the teeth of the waves. And they did so, and the storm was still too much. The waves and the rain, they were filling up the boat swamping it so that at any moment they might be pitched over into the unforgiving depths. And the experienced sailors who did this for a living, they turned to Jesus and found him asleep on the cushion at the back of the boat, infuriating man, asleep on the back of the boat. They rouse him, and in total confoundment, they say to him, do you not care that we are perishing? And with just a word from Jesus, the billows stop, the waves settle, the rain retreats back up into the clouds. The question had been, do you not care? The question they had asked was, do you not care? But when the billows and the swells knew his voice and followed him as if he were a shepherd of the waves, they have the same question that the crowds always asked. A question with a child's simplicity and directness, which makes it, of course, the right question to ask. 
the disciples ask, Who is this? Who is this? That even the wind and the waves should obey his voice. Who is this? I feel for the disciples. I feel for the disciples. If my environs and my clothing had not already given it away, I'm a pretty religious guy. <laughs> and people are still drawn to the compelling and confounding man Jesus of Nazareth, but they can't quite get as close as they would like. He's always just a bit offshore. His teachings are still confounding, inspiring, comforting, seemingly intentionally obscure. And so when people want to know more about Jesus, they turn to his followers, to those who spend their days with him or are supposed to have the answers. And if I'm supposed to have the answers, I don't. The longer that I live as my faith crosses over deeper waters, the less answers I have. Answers, they hardly seem to be the point. Don't get me wrong, I would like answers too, because just like the disciples, I know what it is to be buffeted about by the storms. To be buffeted about by the storms and have my own questions. Where is God in all of this? Where is God in these storms? Literal storms, literal hurricanes, lash our neighbors, those on the coast of Hurricane Alley, as well as those 200 miles inland in the mountains. Those who suffer these climate-driven monsters are no more guilty of creating them than I am. And even if I should make myself an ascetic and live a Spartan lifestyle off the grid, grow trees and then bury them in the ground, make my life carbon negative, that still won't make next hurricane season any safer. It might be an ethical way to live, but my problem is not a guilty conscience. The problem is I can't make these storms stop. The waves are crashing around us. Where is God? Vast forces of economics and foreign policy and history churn off our shores in Haiti. They churn around that island beyond my sight and reach, and washing up on our shores come our neighbors families sleeping at the airport with children, the state government stretching to its utmost opens shelters, recognizing the, the airport is no place for families. The Commonwealth stretches, reaches, falls short. People are back sleeping at the airport. I'm at the airport twice a week, walking past. I've got flights to catch. I can't stop. The waves are crashing. The wind is roaring. Where is God? My seven-year-old daughter playing with stuffies in the living room, playing school. The blocks are desks, and the stuffies are students, and Veronica is the teacher, calmly reassuring them and explaining, stay quiet, stay still, this is a lockdown. And the storm is in my guts. Waves of anger and fear and despair. Do you not care that we are perishing? That question, where is God? That question. That one, actually, I can't answer. It's the question the disciples ask, where is God? And God is right there beside them on the boat asleep on the cushion, which I do not love, but there. Equally caught up and swept up in danger, as I am, God is there alongside the hurricane victims, rejoicing as food was delivered by literal trains of donkeys. Coming down the mountain passes, impassable to trucks, but not a problem for donkeys. Hungry people watching our Lord and Savior of the donkey train. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Our Savior of the donkey train. 
God is there alongside every Haitian who is fleeing violence and seeking safety, rejoicing as people open their homes, as school opens their doors. Where is God? God is our savior of the hot lunch line. And Jesus is with my daughter too, practicing lockdown drills. I can think of no one more fitting to sit among the innocents who have done nothing to deserve this. There's no one more fitting than Christ to sit among the innocents. Where is God, our Savior, of the lockdown drill? That question, where is God, that one I know. God is with us, bound up in human flesh wrapped in vulnerability, born of heaven and yet here on earth to be found, caught in the gyre and the storm, swamped and tempest-tossed. The disciples question, who is this? Who is this who joins our common lot? It is God Almighty beside us, God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus of Nazareth. And answers answers seem hardly the point. How does Jesus make the storm stop? Answers seem hardly the point. The miracle of stilling the waves, this is a small thing. Stilling the waves is child's play for God. Something much greater than that was before the disciples. Something much greater is before us. The miracle that is no small thing, but which took all of what God has, all of who God is, The great miracle that God is in human flesh, is one of us, is with us, knows what it is to grieve and suffer, knows what it is to fall into danger, the one who knew narrow escapes and came to a bad ending. Who is this? He is our savior of the wind and the waves, our shelter from the stormy blast, in our eternal home. Thanks be to God. Amen.